one of the biggest influencers in the trading space and basically the unofficial regulatory body for prop firms. It seems like the consumer doesn't know what they're purchasing. Like people are mm. just purchasing because they think it's their ticket for freedom. Not understanding that even playing with the daily drawdown affects you so much. For example, prop firms that have the one phase challenge. Oh, okay, I only have to pass one phase. Looks so much easier, but the profit to drawdown ratio is two, which mm. means you would be better off going for a two phase challenge than a one phase challenge. Kimo has built a reputation, giving true, transparent, honest reviews on prop firms and all the red flags that they have, whether it's the psychological components, the spread and slippage, the tech providers, and all of these various angles, the hidden smoke and mirrors of prop firms and what we should look out for when we decide to partner up with a prop firm. This is what I tell people. If you're going for a firm, you have to think about, okay, how are they going to make money from me or from anyone else? And so if there is a rule that seems so good to be true, okay, what's the catch? You Sometimes there is no catch, yeah. but with prop firms, there is always a catch. They make money, point blank. Any US guru, like Forex guru, that says that they don't trade on a regulated broker because they don't have enough leverage because they want to flip an account, it's absolute bullshit. Because it's one to 50 leverage on a regulated broker. That is more than enough to flip whatever account you want. But they just don't do it because you can't fake a regulated broker. When it comes to now your situation, you're almost known as the go-to prop firm guy. Yeah. And as you know, better than I, there's a lot of turmoil right now in the prop firm space. So I want to get your take on March, 2024. What is going on in the industry? I always told people, hey, there's one reputable firm, which is Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode. I'm joined by another friend. We have Kimmel over here. Kimmel, you've probably seen him online, whether that's on his YouTube videos or whether collabing on Words of Wisdom or the boat events, whatever. You maybe have seen him around. Um, but I'll let you introduce yourself briefly in terms of where you're from, how old you are, and, and a little bit about your journey, and then we can jump in. Yes, yeah, so my name is Kimmel. Rafael is my first name. So I'm actually natural from Portugal, 50% Portuguese and, and German. That's why Kimmel. Um, and yeah, I started trading in 2018. I was 18 years old. Right now I'm 23. We're in 2024. Um, and, and yeah, ever since then, I started trading, fell in love with trading in of itself because mm. I always had a financial... I always looked at things in a very financial sense. Ever since I was five, I was trying to do business. And if, <laughs> once I was in, in, introduced into stocks and ETFs and indexes and whatever, I remember I went into the bank when I was 16 and I was like, hey, I have 200 bucks and I want to invest it in an ETF. And, <laughs> and the guy was really nice to me. He just brought out a spreadsheet and he was like, okay, listen, here's how much you want to invest. Oh, okay. Here are the commissions that you are going to pay. Here's the return that you need to have every single year just wow. to cover the commissions. And it was like 36% oh. uh, return because back then there was no Robin Hood or mm. like other brokers that had low fees, like 2015, 2016, the fees were still quite high. Um, and then I got introduced into FX when I went into the UK. So I went to study in the UK when I was 18. And I was introduced to FX because of a friend of mine. And he never traded FX, which is weird. Like he okay. said, oh, there's this guy that is like, is the only guy that I would trust my money on. And it was a Social signal media. provider. Ah, okay. And I did not know this, but he was a compulsive liar. It was He was the only Portuguese friend that I had in my class in the UK. The only Portuguese, only friend that I had in that class because I was constantly working and doing other stuff just based on money. So doing delivery, mm. working in a, in a cafeteria, doing other things on the side just to make money because that was always the goal when I was in the UK. I lost a good amount of money as soon as I got into FX. But then I went onto YouTube and I was like, what is this? Because I saw the numbers going up and down mm. and I knew that there was a reason for it. And I was making, I, and I made money sometimes, right? And that's kind of the the gamblish way of looking at it. Like mm. the good thing with trading is that, the bad thing with trading is that sometimes you make money, which means that it creates this expectation yep. that you can make yep. money. It's the same thing as a casino. The casino, they're not going to put the odds extremely in their favor because they want you to have that hope yep. that you are going to make money. And I think that's what I had in the beginning. It was hope that I was going to make money because I was broke, I was working for 800 pounds every single month, mm. working 40 hours a week, going to uni, 
And then I typed into YouTube how like how to trade Forex. Mm. And I saw Hannah Forex and Michael Bamber. So they were like both getting started. They had, they had like 30,000 subscribers or stuff. Mm. They were talking about this one community. And I messaged Hannah and I was like, hey, what do you think of this community? So exactly the same messages that I get right now, which I make sure to answer most of them because... I'm almost like giving back in that sense because mm. I asked Hannah, which was in the same position that I'm in right now, what she thought about that community and she took the time to answer. And ever since then, I joined and I fell in love with it. I think it was the perfect community for me to start because the goal wasn't only trading, it was goal setting, it was daily habits, mm. it was everything that set, my, set myself and my life up so much mm -hmm. and so that's how i got started and that's how i got here so it's interesting you didn't start off first of all with the social media bubble yourself you you ended up in it in terms of exposed to it and then becoming a participant and a trader but that wasn't your first point of contact it was a compulsive live friend yeah and that experience of signals was it mamba fx no 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 <laughs> i mean whoever whoever it was um what, what was the result of that like after doing it for a couple of weeks months or what was your process there before you said that's enough yeah so for three months or four i lost a total of 800 pounds so oh. i remember that i put 400 pounds in because that was the minimum but that was your monthly wage actually yeah exactly Sheesh, okay uh, so i put 800 pounds in luckily i the thing with it being a monthly wage is that I never went out. I didn't eat out once. I didn't order food once. I always, I was spending 30 pounds a month on food. So <laughs> at, at that's like, literally I was eating this slice of lentils, chicken and, lentils, and, yeah. and like a big Gosh. bowl of, of rice. But what were you? You're a student at this point or? Yeah, student. University. Yeah, university okay, student. Yeah, yeah. 18, I get it. I 19. Get it. I was there so. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, I lost 400 pounds. Then I had this hope because I made some money I had like 30 pound trades, 40 pound trades. And so I deposited 400 more and then eventually mm. that that was gone too. And so... Do you think at that point, because you made 30, 40 pounds on the odd winning trade, that based on your situation of I can survive off 30, 40 pounds on food for, for the whole month, that for you was more meaningful? For example, if another person sees 30, 40 pounds, they're like, oh, that, that's a dinner for me. I don't care about 30, 40 pounds. I want to hit a home run. Yeah. Uh, and they want to make, they want to be a millionaire through signals. Yeah. With your expectation of 30, 40 pounds could cover my expenses kind of thing. Yeah. Did that change anything? Or was it just like, uh, as in you had more hope or less hope? Yeah, at that, at that point, my, my expenses every single month, they were so low mm. that 40 pounds is what I would work for in a day. And so have being able to replace or get an extra 40 pounds at the end of the day was, was great for me. Mm. And so that is, because if you really think about it, that's how life really works. It's like, how much is 10,000 pounds? Well, for me, it's a lot if I'm making a thousand pounds a month. But if you're making five mil every single mm. month, then 10,000 is not a lot. Mm. And this is a concept that Luke Belmar talks about, which is you don't look at money given how much it is, but how much time you have to exchange to yep. get it, yep. right? So if, I'm t if I take five minutes to make 10,000 pounds and someone takes one year, which is literally what happens in Portugal, mm. then if I'm buying something for 10,000 pounds and I make that in five minutes, that's whatever. But for my parents that make that in a year, it's like, what the hell of are course. you doing? So that is that is the perspective that I had. Yeah, upon that point, like time for money, the, the people view money as like this evil thing. Some people, it's, it's their God, they worship it, they chase it. But in, in reality, money is two things. It's either your token for time, so time for money, and the amount of money you make is based on how much time you give to your employer. And, and that's one approach. The other one is how much value you provide to the world. And that's then, that can be upon leverage. You can have... Uh, doing doing YouTube videos, you can provide endless value because 50,000 people can watch a video. So either you do it through a leveraged way and therefore it's not time for money, it's value and you get paid for your value or you do time for money, which is a lot of people get stuck on that uh, tokenized time, which money is for a lot of people. In this day and age, prop firms is the best opportunity for traders. But the problem with prop firms is a lot of them have major red flags, too large commission, too large spread, huge percentage gain targets. Alpha Capital, on the other hand, has some of the best trading conditions in the industry with zero dollar commissions, minimal slippage, very competitive spreads, and Alpha Capital is one of the few prop firms that has never denied a payout and they have a clean reputation, which is why I'm proud to be working alongside them. Using the link in the description or the code TOT, you can go ahead and get any challenge for 30% off. Well, I want to actually pivot on to the point of you You started your journey in a way of, uh, you started off with mindset goals and, and uh, setting your roadmap in front of you. 
and in high and whereas other people just start deep into technicals and unfortunately jump into this concept of learn and earn which i think is ridiculous yep. nowhere on earth is this university any degree learn and earn first you learn then earn uh, and i think that habit being instilled uh, is is beautiful but also you had other approaches instilled from that community looking back do you think that was important to have your career in that way and more so for new traders would you want them to start in that approach or do you think jumping into technicals and building that foundation is is imperative you need both so you need the technicals because without technicals you're not going to be a profitable trader but then you also need to have your life set up because if you don't know where you're going then you're not going to go anywhere. Mm. It's the same thing as getting into a car, not knowing what destination you want to go. It's like every time you get into the car, you know, I want to go from here to here. So you know what path you have to take. And that mm. is why that community was so good because they were like, hey, plan your destination. So next year, where do you want to be? And so every single year I would sit down or every single quarter I would sit down and I would be like, okay, this is where I'm at. I would do my reflection. This is where I want to be next quarter. This is what I, where I want to be by the end of the year. And Let's do a mental exercise because I think as a new trader, what they'll probably think is, okay, I'm going to do that. My goal is to be a funded trader. So then they've just set that goal and they're like, okay, I've done my goal setting. So elaborate on what that could look like beyond just, I need to be funded because I think that's everyone's goal. And then they just directly approach that, but there's probably smaller goals along the way you could have. Yeah. So it's funny because let's say I want to get into that desk. That That is my goal. So there's a desk, by the way. The thing that is going to happen is that I won't just be at that desk. I have to step. I have to go one step at a time. Mm. And so the question is, what are those steps? And so what I what I tell everyone that asks me about goal setting is, okay, this is your goal. What do you have to do in the next quarter to be closer to achieving that goal? Okay, now you have that benchmark on the quarter. What have you? What do you have to do next month to be closer to that goal? Mm. What do you have to do next week? And what do you have to do tomorrow? So that is why daily goals are extremely important. So every single day you should have to, you should know what do you want to achieve next day, right? Mm. For, a f for someone that wants to get funded, let's do that mental exercise. Okay, you want to get funded. What do you have to be? You have to be a profitable trader. Okay, how can you become a profitable trader? Well, you have to backtest. Mm -hmm. You have to journal. You have to actually do some learning of technical analysis. You have to apply technical analysis. You have to do it on a demo. You have to do it on a small, small live account. You have to prove it to yourself. Then journal everything, as, as said before to then be able to go for a challenge, to then be able to get to become a funded trader, mm. right? But all of these small steps are in between. And then the thing is, okay, you have to backtest, but it's not only one day. Mm. You have to backtest, let's say, five years worth of data on the pair that you're trading to then be able to know, okay, I have a profitable edge, to then go into the applying phase mm. and then going to, into the journal, journaling phase and then tweaking everything and understanding, okay, so this is where I, what I'm doing right. This is what I'm doing wrong. Then just give it time because that's the problem with trading is that you can put the most amount of work in in one single week. Next trading day is a loss. <laughs> you could yeah. have you could have all the prep preparation in the world. Eventually, you will you will take a yeah. loss, and it's disheartening. But mm. this is where you have to keep the bigger picture in mind because again, the goal is the table. Mm. And back to the question that you that you had which is the problem with that community is that then it also became kind of a cult. This is mm. this is where the young me stepped in and he was like, okay, this is not good. Because I understood that everyone that was leaving and a lot of people were leaving at the time, they were being frowned upon. They were like, oh, this peop these people left, they're, they're weak, they're not, doing, they're not putting the work in, they're not focused on the process, they're just focused on the results. But again... As a trader, you shouldn't just be focused on one strategy. Of course you should, but as a new trader, you also have to learn various different right. things. And that is where after I actually started going into another strategy, was a, which was a price action strategy, then went to, into SMC and eventually landed on ICT. Mm. But I wouldn't get to ICT if I hadn't gone through all of right. these previous things and if I wasn't open to change. Because mm. that is the problem. A lot of people that go into one strategy, including ICT, they're not open to change. You also mentioned like the journey, uh, let's say approaching that table or the goal of being a funded trader. You broke it down into certain milestones. The first one you mentioned was backtesting. Now, backtesting is a term, it's like baby pips. Everyone knows you should backtest. 
but not everybody knows. Okay, now they're approaching their laptop. They're like, okay, I got I got an hour free in the evening. I need to backtest. But then they just like mess around on TradingView. What is backtesting to you? And also, what is the objective of backtesting to know when you've completed it? Or what are you looking to achieve from your backtesting? Yeah, so for me, backtesting was always, okay, I have this strategy that I, want, that I want to apply on this pair. So I'm going to backtest the next three, the previous three years and see what the data tells me. So backtesting to me is just going back in the data, having a something that I want to test out, a strategy that I want to test out and applying it on to the previous charts. So let's say I'm trading support and resistance. Okay, I'm going back three to five years, depending on the time frame that you trade, at least 100 to 500 trades you need to have in your back testing. And then just trade as if you were trading the live market. Mm -hmm. That is exactly it. The problem is people go into it without knowing what they want to apply, mm -hmm. right? If you, if you don't know, or if you're trading like, 15 different pairs and you're trying to do all the same. No, it's just like focus on one, focus on a strategy and apply that strategy on previous data. That's literally what backtesting is. And then you go onto a Notion template or whatever it is, a journal, and you journal every single trade as if you were trading live. Mm -hmm. Because like that, by the end of the three or four years, you'll have at least 100 trades that you mm -hmm. can review and be like, okay, these were the common common mistakes of the losses. These were the common patterns of the winners. And then you can apply it over and over again. Okay, so it sounds like for you, backtesting is uh, useful and there should be a lot of time involved when you're in the curation phase of your strategy. Yeah. Once you've kind of got a strategy or you've, found, you've done this process for a couple of years on a couple of pairs, you're confident, and then you've journaled your performance in the backtesting, found the commonalities, the common denominators, the issues, the tendencies that are going wrong, and then you optimized it. Now you've got a strategy. Would you then continue to backtest in, in, in thereafter? Th that is where it goes down to personal preference. I have friends that are extremely profitable and they still backtest to this day, which... I would I would advise them otherwise because I see them having a lot of like analysis paralysis like this friend that I'm thinking about he've been, he's been wanting to go for prop firms for the last two years but he's like I'm just tweaking this last thing mm. and I'm like you just apply it mm. on the live market right he has a profitable strategy if you have a profitable strategy you have to apply it live yep. like you can't you can't just going just keep all of your work being done in previous data, you have to now do the Absolutely. forward testing, yep. for example, yep. like watching the live market trading demo or a small live account, mm. because then how do you know if it's going to work? Because it, it matters the statistics behind, but if you can't apply it live because then your emotions step in or yep. you, you have analysis paralysis, that's where the live trading comes in. And a lot of I people think, miss think, that. Yeah, that, that part is essential because if you're just stuck in a backtesting world and you say, once I've perfected my strategy in backtesting, now I just need to go and do a prop firm. You're, rem you're removing the element of it, which is a huge void, which is a psychology gap between everybody can reach profitability in backtesting environment. And then they yep. come to the live market, they just mess it up. And that space is, is the forward testing you mentioned. Because there's a big thing that people don't understand because backtesting is, is fake. Backtesting yep. is fake. Why? Because let's say now I'm going to backtest February on Euro dollar. I've seen every single candle on Euro dollar during February, mm -hmm. which means I'm going to have a winning bias. Yep. So I'm going to be backtesting Euro dollar February. And I'm going to happens, be like, yeah. I know, I know this is a loss. So I wouldn't enter in this trade because of this, this, and this. Yep. You can't do that in the live mm -hmm. market. In the live market, you're going to either take the trade or not. And a lot of people going to the backtesting, knowing what is going to happen. And so they don't take this trade that was a loss or mm -hmm. take this trade that wasn't in the plan, but they know we're a winner. Yep. Now, the reason I asked, do you still backtest after you've created a curation of a strategy is a lengthy process. And, and you mentioned, you know, go through at least 100 trades. That's where you begin and then you tweak and it, you could spend six months just curating a strategy, even with a mentor. Um, once you've done that, and in my position, probably you too, once you've done that hard work, I feel like then you're on to the next stages in your career. And for those reasons you exactly mentioned, first of all, it's not a complete simulated environment. Second of all, if you are now showing up to the market every day, you know what happened and therefore backtesting is, it's not backtesting anymore. You're kind of with a confirmation or bias and you're yep. reverse engineering what happened. 
And for me now, it doesn't serve me because I'm watching Euro dollar and GBP dollar daily, and I've watched it for the last two years. So at the end of my, on a Friday, and I go to my weekend now, what am I going to backtest? Am I going to review? I review my trades, I review my performance, but I don't backtest the week because I know exactly what I yeah. did. And then, I mean, a lot of people then face an issue of if you're trading a lot of asset classes or a lot of pairs, then you're backtesting and creating a strategy on EU, but then you go and trade gold. That could be an issue. Second of all, let's say you only trade EU and GU. Then you say, okay, I, I know what happened this week. Let me go back to this CAD JPY, which might not serve you. So what is your views upon that element of um, backtesting your not pairs or, um, you know, in, in general, once you've curated the strategy or do you just remove it now from, from a major task for yourself? I mean, I basically just remove it from a major okay. task because I don't, there comes a point where it's like, do you really want to be stuck in the charts every single day, even mm. on the weekends and every time you're not working. I think that's important in first year, maybe second year, while, while, you, while you are trying to get to any profitability with any strategy. Mm. But there comes a point, I know that I could now tell you some ICT concepts, you would go to the live market and you would be profitable. This, like, there comes a point where you've seen so many things play out there that backtesting, it's almost like a tool as a, a warm up before the market, let's say. Yeah. Like, okay, I haven't been trading for the last three months. Let me backtest here for a couple of hours before I go into the live market. I like that analogy. You, you warm up before the game. Once you're playing the game in halftime, you don't warm up again. You just. Yeah. You exactly. Know, you, you, exactly. You recover and go again. Exactly. Okay. The next portion you mentioned after the backtesting curation of a strategy was then forward testing. If you could touch a little bit on that, and then the the journaling performance side of that. These two things, which I think is probably where your focus is on now. What does that look like? Yeah. So forward testing depends if you are doing it with live capital or not. I personally don't do forward testing with live capital, or if I do, it's on a smaller account with at least ten percent of my account portfolio. So let's say I have a 100K account. If I'm doing forward testing, I'm doing with 10K. Cool. So forward testing is the act of looking at the live market. And as you see the live market, you execute as if you are executing live. So let's say that you see a liquidity sweep, a market shift, and you think it, and you would enter on that trade according to your plan. Forward testing is you're not doing it on a prop firm, you're not doing it on a big account, but you're actually getting the data from the live market. You tell yourself, okay, I would enter in this trade, so I'm going to ASR it, so I'd do a, review it as if I had entered in this trade. Okay. And so you put the risk to reward tool or whatever it is on trading view. If the trade triggers, then okay, you treat that as if it was a live trade and you see how it plays out. And what are you looking to achieve there that you wouldn't get in back testing? As in, why does the forward testing exist? Live emotions, right? That's the mm -hmm. difference between back testing and forward testing because back testing, you're a couple of clicks away of getting the next day. Mm. While with forward testing, you have to handle drawdown of like a five-minute yeah. candle takes five minutes to play out. A one-hour candle takes one hour to play out. So that's what you get in the in the forward testing that mm. you don't get in the back testing. It's live market. Perfect. Yeah, it was the it was the emotional element, and then your reviewing journaling process. What does that look like for you? Because I think everybody says they journal, uh, but everyone does something a little bit different. What does journaling look like for you? Yeah, so by the end of every day, if I've entered in any trades, every trade should be on a Notion template for me. And I also use Tradezilla, but that is the automated part because mm. I think the the manual part is also quite important. And I tell people, like I talk about Tradezilla in my channel, yet I still say, hey, you should also have a Notion. Why? Why is that? Because when you are when you are doing it on a notion and it's not automated, you have to go on trading view, click copy image, post it. Copy like go to another time frame, copy uh, image, you post be it. Doing that. So it's you have to look at the trade so much longer than hey, it's it's already in the journal. I'll, I'll write a, I'll write a little bit about it, and then it's good. No, mm. it, it, the tedious task is going to make you. Instead of being there for five minutes, you are 20 minutes ASRing a trade or like reviewing yeah. the trade, which is the important part for beginners. That's what I think. I was going to say exactly that. Like it sounds useful, but if I had to spend 20 minutes every day, I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people, because I already have reached a point where I don't require it. But yep. in the beginning, yes, probably spending a bit of time does actually make sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, to force yourself to do it and force yourself to get into the habit. And then reward yourself with an easier way to do it, which is a yeah. bit more automated and yeah. uh, fair enough. Um, okay, so now once you've got a strategy based down, 
you've practiced it for testing it and then you're journaling it um that's probably where you are now or are you doing anything else in your weekly trading work yes no it's just it's just live trading and mm. journaling so even the forward testing it's not really forward testing because i'm trading it live cool so yeah when it comes to now your situation your it's almost like i don't think it was intentional we are almost known as the the go to prop firm guy yeah. uh, i think some of your videos did really well and you did like a prop firm oscars award which i think was sick um and therefore people trust and value your opinion and as you know better than i the there's a lot of turmoil right now in in the prop firm space with regulators meta quotes uh, red flags in general so i want to get your take on right now like march 2024 what is the update what is going on in the industry i think it's so funny because looking back i always told people hey there are there's one reputable firm which is ftmo if you want to be safe if you want to make sure that the that the company is here in 10 years time, you go for FTMO. And every time people like, I'm not affiliated with FTMO, I'm affiliated with other firms. And I always say, hey, go for FTMO first. And that's a little bit of what people like, because if I'm constantly just selling what I affiliate myself with, mm. then it it's not genuine. Yep. But every time someone is like, hey, what prop firm should I go for? Are you funded with FTMO? No, go for FTMO. Oh, but you have 10% profit target and 10% drawdown. Well, y yes, but at the same time, all of these other firms are having huge amount of issues, be it with MetaTrader, be it with other other platforms being trash or, or simply not working huge slippage while FTMO has never had those issues. Or payouts denied after all exactly. your work. So, yeah. I mean, right now, right before you were filming, I guess we don't say who it was, um, but you just had 12 pips slippage on EU. Like, yeah. what, what the hell is that? I, no, I, I made a calculation. So in the last two trading days, so Monday and Friday, I've had like $10,000, literally $10,000 being taken away from me and if and I'm not counting running profits because if I'm counting running profits it goes to 15,000 it's ridiculous 15,000 loss for just bad bad f trading conditions like not actually your losses it was just yeah, not so, an equal playing field so one of them was the platform stopped working and and it was a high impact news event i wanted to so close the trade uh, and i and i as you know i couldn't use a stop loss because if i use a stop loss then it automatically it gets triggered. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's like 60 pips away, which I'm not understanding, this but I'm talking instead of, th this is the difference with me, which is if there is a solution, I would rather find a solution first, talk with the with the people, like talking with support and doing whatever, than being here and being like, oh, this firm is trash. Like, yeah. oh, they, they stole from me. And it's like, okay, chill. I don't have to do that if I can at least try to solve it. And then obviously, let's say I get banned for some reason, like the system bans me. I talk with support or I talk with whatever and they're like, oh yeah, just leave. Obviously I'm going to be public with it. Yeah, your, your but, testimony of your, your reality. But not not if it's something that can be solved. You know, my, my view on prop firms in general has been there's so many out there and there's so many new ones popping up and a lot of them are influencer-backed. So the influencer-backed one seems to me that's not their main thing. It's not their expertise. It's not their main business. They don't have history with it. They just pop up seeing an opportunity and then they leverage other people. They leverage this guy's tech and this guy's broker and this guy's this and that, this guy's customer support. And they just whip it all together overnight and then say, hey guys, buy my prop firm, which maybe they have good trading conditions in the sense of, oh, you only have to make 8%, not 10. Maybe you have no time limit now and benefits over the gold standard, which is probably FTMO. And they might knock off fifty dollars. So you're like, okay, it's cheaper and uh, it's seemingly a better opportunity. But then when you are faced with these real red flags of you might not even get a payout, you might face uh, bad customer support, you might get slipped to hell literally. Then it's like, well, you might as well pay the extra fifty dollars yep. and the extra two percent profit target, yep. and then know you're re with a reliable company. Meaning to say, there's certain red flags you see with uh, a lot of the prop firms and maybe not with all of them, what are those red flags that you, you would advise traders say, prioritize these these uh, situations that a prop firm is offering, not necessarily their price and profit target alone, but what are these other things? For example, one that comes to mind is, um, if you trade a smaller stop loss as I do, and you're trading with not a raw spread account, detrimental for my way of trading, if I have a five pip stop loss and three pips of spread, well, that's a significant increase yeah. in my, in my uh, well, I have to reduce my my lot size. That's one thing. Another thing is the commissions. 
So you might say, oh, I might have a raw spread account and everything looks great, but they might get you on this hidden tax of commissions. If we're paying $10 per lot and you, you know that could, that could sneak into thousands of dollars per week um, just by a hidden tax that you weren't aware of, what would you say traders should look into for deciding a problem that they don't usually look into? So first is something that I think I personally came up with, but it's just a, a mathematical equation. So anyone could have come up with, which is the profit to drawdown ratio. Because a lot of people try to sell you on, hey, my prop firm is so much cheaper, but their conditions are terrible. So let's say your phase one profit target is 8%. Phase two is 5%, so the standard. But your maximum drawdown is, let's say, 8%. So you have 13, so the the sum of both profit targets, 13 divided by 8. So you have a 1.7 around profit to okay. drawdown ratio. So that is worse than you having 10% profit target, which is, this is FTMO, 10% profit target, 5% phase two, that's 15 divided by 10. So you have 1.5 profit to drawdown I ratio. Yeah, yeah. So the, you, people need to understand that whatever you get extra, you lose somewhere else with prop firms because it's, it's, like a, it's literally like a casino. The casino has always a statistical edge. Mm. So for example, a prop firm that we, that we know the owners of, they have a plan that is 6% drawdown no, no, 6% profit target phase one, 6% phase two. Then max drawdown is 10%. But the daily drawdown is 4%. What people don't know is that a lot of people fail on the daily drawdown. And so... How interesting. Okay. Yeah, so... As in, they don't, the, the, out of all the conditions to go lose your account on, the usually is the daily drawdown. Yes. Which I, seems like a very simple fix, actually. Yeah. Okay. I think it's like 50% of people lose because of a daily drawdown, oh, actually. Okay. okay. And the, the thing with prop firms... Just, just to speculate on that, is that people that are not using a stop loss and they just, oops, I, I went too far? Or is they know and they just can't stop themselves? No, it's just, I think it's over leveraging. And so over leveraging and going for, let's say I have 4% daily drawdown and what I do is I risk 3.5%. Right, so I still have that zero point five percent buffer. Yeah, your casino, you're casino, you're using it as a casino. You but just then, want trade to pass kind but of then thing. they forget the commission, or maybe they forget right. the, maybe they forget the spread, slippage yep. or spread, yep. all of that, and then people just, just get fucked basically. So, and I think it's the problem with with prop firms in general, which is, it seems like the consumer doesn't know what they're purchasing. Like people are mm. just purchasing because they think it's their ticket for freedom not understanding that even playing with the daily drawdown affects you so much. Yeah. So for example, prop firms that have the one phase challenge, it looks amazing. Oh, okay, I only have to pass one phase. It looks so much easier, but the profit to drawdown ratio is two, which mm. means you would be better off going for a two phase challenge. It would be easier to pass than a one phase challenge. Yeah. Then they add something like the trailing drawdown. Right, yeah. so you make 5%, now you can't even go below, b below break even. Right. Those, those ones, that that stuff, like, I forgot if it was uh, balance, no equity based or the trailing one, just makes me angry. Yeah, like because it's I didn't understand until you explained it to me twice, and then I finally started to understand. It's like it's worded such complicated on their website that you're like, ah, oh, whatever. Yeah, and then you would just lose an account not knowing because you could be in profit. Well, you explain it because I don't think even everybody's got the hang of what exactly it is. But it's like you'll be in profit in a trade, you might have hit your TP and still lose your account, and you're like, what the hell was that all about? Yeah, so. There's three different drawdown types. You have balance, you have equity, and you have trailing. So balance is basically at the end of the day, so 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the prop firm looks at the balance that you have, and the daily drawdown is that minus 5%. Let's say that the daily drawdown is 5%, so it's balance minus 5%. That so is your daily drawdown. Account, you, you, five, you have, five, yeah, yeah. 95,000. Equity is, let's say you are running 3% on a trade, on a 100K account. So now you have 103K equity by 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But not balance, you didn't close it. It's yes. a floating yes. trade. Yes, it's a, it's a floating trade, 3% yeah. profit. You still have 5% daily drawdown, but it's now based on equity. So they take 103K and they put minus 5% and that is your maximum loss for that day. So if the trade goes into minus 2%, from from being in three percent profit, is just a healthy retracement. No, minus minus you would have to go minus five percent. So you have you would have to go from three percent profit into minus two percent. So okay, okay. 
there is, a, there is a, yeah. yeah, there yeah. is a, that is a more extreme. Uh, so, but let's say you're running, let's say with SMC, you're running one to 10 R full, full volume, 1% risk. You're running 10%. The next day that the trade pulls back 5% because that is possible. If you're, mm. if your stop losses are really that tight, then you lose the account. Yeah, um, as in like you were 10% up, you had a retracement, so you were still 5% up. Yeah. But because from, from that 10% profit to 5% profit, you had a bit of drawdown yeah. in unrealized p &L, Yeah. then you lose the account, yeah. whether funded or challenged. That and, seems annoying, yeah. And most companies will not pay you even the 5%. Because you've mm. breached the daily the, drawdown, the term, which means they'll yeah. just take your account away. And some do, like some pay like thirty percent or they whatever. They pay a difference, okay. Um, but, but you lost the account, you lost, you lost, you wasted your time. That's referred to as the equity, equity based. Yeah. And then the other one, the third one, is the trailing yeah. based. Yeah. The trailing drawdown is the one that I dislike the most. Yeah. But now uh, Kyle Jade Cap, he's been trading trading futures, and I'm like. Damn, like, okay, because Kyle is the most professional trader that I know in terms of like looking at it long term. And he's like, hey, like the trailing drawdown just forces you to be a good trader. And it's true. I still don't like it at all. But it's the price you pay, for example, if you want to go for a futures firm. If you want to go for a futures firm, like if you really want the money from a futures firm, you have to accept trailing drawdown. It's Usually the trailing drawdown is how many percent? So it, it depends because then it gets fixated on initial balance. But okay. futures firm, they they go so much deeper into it, which is which is wild. But the trailing drawdown normally is six percent from the CFD firms. Okay, so let's say you're ten percent up, and then you you have your equity curve goes up. You have a losing period. That let's lose, say you close the trade at ten percent. It, it's following. It's trailing you on balance, not equity. Some trail on equity. Some trail on Gosh, balance. Okay, meaning to say, yes, it for you force you to be a good trader, but there's also like an unrealistic element of every trader is going to have a losing period. Every trader might have five percent in a losing streak. That could also just void you, which is in some instance or a lot of instances completely unavoidable. It goes back to the point you said of we can't look for a perfect prop firm because it just wouldn't exist because of how the business model is set. They need something to catch yes, you on. Exactly. So if every prop firm is just say spinning plates and yep. saying, okay, which one should we get you on? Um, let's first of all talk about what they have in their arsenal. What is their ways to get you in terms of you, they ha you have the profit target. If they make it too high, yep. they got you. They have these stop uh, equity trailing stop and ba balance based. That's one way they can get you commissions and spreads. What else would you say is other ways they could so maneuver? I would say, I would say the, the most important things you have to look at that makes prop firms the most profitable is the daily drawdown. That is going to be one of the big factors. You have uh, commissions. So if it's, let's say you have zero spreads, but you're paying $10 commission, then that's basically as if you had one pip spread on mm. whatever pair has zero. Yep. Then you have spreads if they're too high. Then you have the maximum drawdown, the type of drawdown. You also have any type of minimum profit to withdraw. So for example, I know a company that says they have payout on demand. So as soon as you get the account, you can get you can get the first payout in the first trade that you take. Mm. But they don't really say that it has to be 3%. Uh -huh. And that on that payout you only get 50% of the payout. Right? Oh, sneaky. Yeah. So they you you all like this is what I tell people. If you're going for a firm, you have to think about, okay, how are they going to make money from me or from anyone else? Mm. And so if there is a rule that seems so good to be true, okay, what's the catch? Because there is a catch on prop firms, you know? Yeah. You know, sometimes people message you and they're like, hey, I have this business idea or I want to I want to go out with dinner with you and and pay for with Urla, for example. Like, you know, it's going to be a good dinner. Okay, what's the catch? What Sometimes there yeah. is no catch. Yeah. But with prop firms, there is always a catch, mm. right? They make money, point blank, mm. right? So when people see, oh, pay out on demand, oh, this firm is so much better, or oh, they're so cheap, mm. why are they cheap? Why is there this really good condition? Why is the first yeah. payout on demand? So what I'm kind of uh, sensing from you is there's certain conditions that that's how they get you. For example, the daily drawdown. If they know most of their traders are just reckless and they just blow more than they should in a day, they get emotional, they just try and gamble it. That's like, okay, that's such an avoidable one. Like if, if you're a consumer of a problem, you want to do it right, just don't gamble it. And, yep. and you want that condition, the way they get you there is not going to affect you. Um, to avoidable terms, and that, that that's still fine to trade with a prop firm like that. But then there's the ones that are completely un 
unavoidable or um, they are just detrimental. So for, from my perspective is if there's a prop firm that has got good trading conditions in general, they don't, they don't do certain things, but then they have large commissions and they have large spread. I just don't want, don't want to run uphill. So even yeah. though I can factor it in and I can say, okay, I'll just uh, factor in my commissions and spread into my stop loss and therefore do it smaller lot size. Yeah, I can. But then this other prop firm is not doing that and I, it's easier to achieve profitability. So if you are to look at the, uh, the ones you just listed, the avoidable uh, conditions that they have on how to get you, just don't gamble and the daily drawdown won't be an issue. And then unavoidables, just so we can start to assess when I'm looking at which prop firm to work with, what criteria is more important? Because they're going to word it in a way and show it on their website to force you into an opinion. But if we are to look at it more objectively, what are the things that kind of take it as it is? It's not going to be a problem if you're sensible. And these ones are just like, it's running uphill. So I wouldn't go for any one face challenge. Not at all, because the trailing drawdown is going to get you. I would always go for two face challenge and don't go for three face challenges too, because they just put another phase on you where you have to achieve an extra 5%. So think about the total profit that you have to achieve. And that is, you always have to achieve at least 10%. Mm -hmm. Like the minimum that I know of a good firm is 12%. So you have to achieve anywhere between 13 and 15% to pass the challenge. Then I wouldn't go for anything below 10% maximum drawdown. Then the maximum daily loss, if you are not a gambler, then 4% is good, mm -hmm. right? But we also have to understand that prop firms, they play on the gamblers. They make money from the gamblers, mm -hmm. right? And so what I've understood, and, and, and this is not insider information, it's just something that I came up with myself, which is they change the maximum drawdown, the daily drawdown, because for the people that are trying to full margin their daily drawdown, it's harder for them to pass. So let's do this thought exercise. 12% maximum drawdown on this company that we know. Uh, no, 12% Profit target on this company that we know. In, in two phases. Yes, in two okay. phases. 4% maximum drawdown, uh, daily drawdown. So that is, you have to achieve 3x your daily drawdown to achieve the two phases. Mm -hmm. While if we are going for a normal challenge where it's 8, 3, or 8, 5, so 13% total profit target and 5% daily drawdown, then you have to achieve 2.5% x the daily drawdown which means if you want to gamble it you have to go for a for a five percent daily drawdown it's going to be easier than a four percent daily drawdown because mm. there's multipliers in there too mm. it's like a, everything is a mathematical game and so depending on what the trader wants to do you mm. have to keep that in mind because i don't know how much you know about card counting and blackjack and 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 etc so every casino, they have a diff different set of rules for blackjack. So for some casinos, blackjack is 1 to 1 1.5. So if you have a blackjack, you get, no, uh, one, to, 1 to 3, whatever. You get whatever you bet plus that plus 50%. While there are other casinos where it's you get what you, you, get what you paid, double, and then just like 30%. Just that already mixes with your EV, with your expected value of the game. Mm -hmm. So very slight changes in the rules. So for example, there's one that is the deal. The dealer hits on a soft 17, which is an ace plus a six. And there, there's, there's the rule of the dealer stands at soft 17. That changes the probabilities completely on mm -hmm. a game. There, for, for blackjack players, there are softwares that tell you exactly what the expected value of each uh, rules are, each set of rules. And that's why when you, you, when you see some videos about card counting, they say, oh, this game is not profitable. That's why online blackjack is not profitable mm. because you need to keep in mind the depth of the deck, like how many cards they go through. Like there's so many things that go- Hidden variables that exactly, affect everything more than you realize. Okay. That only a professional- blackjack player knows everyone else is just like hey i'm a gambler i'm I, they are going to lose money in the long term Crazy. so how do you want to approach prop firms do you want to be the gambler that doesn't really look at the rules or do you want to go a little bit more in depth and mm. choose the one that has the highest likelihood of you succeeding e extrapolate that because i'm very intrigued extrapolate that concept of small changes can make the whole game almost rigged without forward facing people realizing is there things in prop firms that they can just tweak these two things like the daily drawdown you said they could tweak just, just make it like you might as well write off a prop firm that does these kind of things 
So anything that is trailing drawdown, I think you, you could write it off. Anything that is a minimum minimum payout percentage, I think you could write it off. Okay. Because for example, with FTMO, this is a, this is something that I've always done with FTMO, which is like gaming, not with FTMO, with any prop firm, which is almost like gaming the system, which is, let's say I get funded with a 200K account. That that account cost me $1,000 to pay, to, to buy. If I pass a challenge, I only make like $200 and I wait for the first profit split. Why? Because that gets me the full refund. Mm. Full refund plus the bonus on the refund plus the $200 that I profited. So now I have a risk-free account. Mm. But there are companies that add, for example, you'd least, you need at least 1% to get a profit split. You need at mm. least 3% to get the profit split, which increases the likelihood of these companies not paying traders out mm. because they won't get there. So what that, about, that about, is one of the rules. What about the profit splits? Because I feel like a lot of traders are just so concerned on price and, and passing the challenge. So they're looking at profit targets, daily drawdown and these variables that they don't forget. If you are to get funded, a $50 off is not going to be as important as a 90-10 split versus a 70-30 split. Because if, you, if it's a 100K account, just giving away an extra 20%. Uh, ju just uh, as a profit split is going to be way more than the twenty, fifty, hundred dollars you saved. Um, so when you when you look at it overall, if you can kind of make a, we've spoken about some red flags. What about green flags of like the, these things are what you should look out for when you are saying this is a problem I want to work with long term. I would think about the systems that they have behind them. So let's say they have their own broker. They are not based in the US, I would say. Because uh, it's the thing, this okay. is getting into territory that I don't know in terms of legislation. Okay. But in terms of green flags, I would say at least minimum 80-20 profit split, as you said. Um, if they're trying to sell themselves as being the cheapest firm, run away. There's something bad in there. So green flags, it's... A com how come though? Because I, I, from just the firms I know and the founders I know, if they have their own tech provide, if they have their own tech and they don't have to uh, use a third party, they're saving a lot of money by not having to do a profit split. So therefore they can make the same profit as a percentage, but because they, they have less cost, so they can compete on price that way. And therefore usually they are the cheap ones or am I wrong in saying that? Yes and no, because one of those firms has the minimum percentage for profit split. So, okay, so then you just got to look at all of the moving parts. And yeah. then, there's not one size fits all. Exactly, okay. exactly. So there are a lot of moving parts there, but it, it goes back to the idea of just go for the ones that have been at least one year around, which okay. is counterproductive, which is like uh, what I say is almost it, it's very counterproductive because if a firm, if no one goes for a firm that isn't one year around, then they're not going to be one year around. But mm. some people have to trust that these firms are going to to work. But mm. I personally, I don't affiliate myself with any companies below one year because I know it's the riskiest part of the business. Mm. And like, what's their track record? How much have they paid out? Mm. What do you think their revenues are? Because if the company ha doesn't have a lot of revenue, they are going to struggle to pay you out yep. on a big way. Are there a lot of people getting denied payouts? Are a lot of people talking good about the firm? Like yeah. there's there's a lot of things that people need to look into. And I would say, as I said, the green flags are own broker, uh, depending, uh, own platform, own, own tech. Based, I'm just thinking about two firms to be fair. I'm thinking about Alpha and I'm thinking about FTMO to be very fair. Like they have their own brokers, they have their own tech, they have big the people founders, behind it. Yep. So the founders, the founders like of the FTMO founders, they were really kids when they were when they founded FTMO. They were like 21 and 22, but now they work with Deloitte, which is one of the biggest firms in Europe, yep. uh, legal firms. So and they spend a lot of money to uh, for that. Then you have Alpha Capital that has FCA regulation. Like one of the founders is FCA regulated, which means they can't be doing nothing shady because if they get caught, one of the founders is going to lose way more mm. than just a couple of million from a firm. It's, it's like that insurance policy or collateral of yeah. the founder that they don't have a vested interest to do anything bad because it's going to affect them more than just an influencer back to one. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So we've kind of spoken about red flags, green flags, and then also you kind of named which ones you like. That's kind of the the prop firm summary. 
Now, what about the industry as a whole? Because as of now, we've seen a big shift where a lot of them have been delisted from Metacodes. And obviously, this is a lot of speculation. We don't know exactly why and the, and the reasons behind it, but we can still commentate on, on what we think is going on, number one, and what we see as a result of that for the industry, for these rising prop firms and so forth. What is your overall uh, opinion on what's going on and why has everyone been delisted apart from the two you mentioned, actually? Yeah, so... Everything is now based on meta quotes either wanting you in there or not. So, for example, most firms, they got taken out of meta quotes because meta quotes first doesn't make money from these firms because any demo account is free on meta quotes. So everyone was using it and they were getting complaints. So meta quotes was getting complaints about this broker, about this prop firm, about this broker, this broker. So it's headache for Absolutely mm. no reward. So, so what uh, is that, this? that's something I didn't know until you told me. How does MetaQuotes make money? For, for people to understand why, why these prop firms were not generating money for MetaQuotes. I don't know for sure, but I do think that they make money from each live account that okay. they have. So if you open an account, let's say with IC Markets, uh, and it's a real funded account, real live account that is yours, then MetaQuotes probably makes money, but I don't know the, the business of MetaQuotes. From, from what I vaguely know is uh, each server, you see like IC Market Server 22. Yeah. And they also each, each one of them servers, they're paying an annual fee, which is a significant one. And obviously you have more servers when you have more real accounts. So that's one. And then it's per account from what I've understood. So then when you mentioned to me the gray label thing of pro firms are utilizing an AIDS cap, let's say, ACAP is paying the server costs and is paying for the accounts that they have, which is live. But then all of these demo accounts that prop firms are, well, it's not bringing them any more servers and it's yep. not bringing them any more live accounts. Um, and as you said, it's bringing them the headache of complaints and stuff, or even for just for meta quotes, complaints to the company of, yep. I'm using your platform. Why are you allowing me to work? Yep. Why are you hosting these crappy, crappy brokers or whatever? So it could be just as simple as that. It wasn't generating revenue and, and being a headache. Is there more to it? Is there a conspiracy side to it potentially? I do think that there is legislation behind it. And there is also like the war with Ukraine type of... Con Russia, US. Yeah, yeah, conspiracy. Yeah, yes. you, you have that one, but I don't know for sure. So you have the conspiracy of the war between Ukraine and Russia, which America is also involved. You have the possibility of legislation. So MetaTrader is basically facilitating people from the US having ask access to CFDs mm. and they shouldn't have access to CFDs because they're banned in the US. Yeah. And that is and that is why they're like taking everyone out that is offering CFDs to US traders. So that's why mm. C trader is also not allowed in in US. Yes, yeah, so this was what was interesting me like Metacodes is delisting US clients and so forth and we know but then people are just jumping ship to C trader or DX, DX trade. which I'd never have heard of. That doesn't solve the problem. That's just, yeah. they just don't have, it's a ticking time bomb. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's putting a bandaid on 100%. Yeah, so what, I spoke to a founder of another brokerage um, who's regulated FSA, Seychelles, I think. And he was like, I had a call with Metacodes today and he was like, I'm confident. Well, he's just like, this is the situation. He was basically saying that the regulators, as you said, the SEC and the financial bodies in the US, they are putting pressure on MetaQuotes because people are saying, well, why is MetaQuotes acting as a regulator when they're not? They're just a SaaS, actually. Yeah. They're just a software company. Uh, it's because they have pressure from the people above them, the regulator, yeah. and they are basically saying the risk reward of hosting these people is not worth it, which if the pressure is coming to MetaQuotes, well, next where the, the regulator is going to go is the other places where people are running yeah. to. All in all to say, it's a ticking time bomb. Where does this lead us to for specifically US clients and prop firms in general, maybe on a five-year horizon? In a five-year horizon, probably most US traders are going to be trading futures. And that's why you are seeing such a big shift into futures. And I've made a video about this not long ago, which is why are traders switching into futures? It's not because it's regulated, oh, and it, it's a centralized, which is a big plus for futures. It's a centra it's centralized, a, a broker can't slip you, like just mm. because they want your, your money, right? Futures is, is centralized, it's regulated, everyone gets the same price feed, everyone gets the same, exactly, just price feed. Yeah. And you can see the orders that are going in and going out because it's just one exchange. And that is regulated by the US. And so I would say, this is just pure speculation, but 99% of US traders will have to be in 
futures firms or just trading futures because else like they can't like they don't have access to cfds the trading is not going yeah. anywhere so yeah. they, they have to move to a market yeah um which is interesting because a lot of people don't trade stocks simply because there's not really prop firms around stocks and you need a lot of capital for it to be a worthwhile so stocks gets kind of yes written off for beginners Crypto is still uh, an immature market and there's a lot of crypto, pump and dumps. Crypto is also very hard for US traders. They don't have access to Binance. I don't think they have okay. access to Bybit. They don't have oh, access to any of that. Only yeah. futures. Okay, so if, if the stock market is, is not ideal for beginners, crypto is not the best for it's an immature market. It's not accessible to everyone and day trading it is not the easiest and you have a lot of manipulations. Then you're kind of left with futures, Forex and commodity trading. Why do you think everyone runs to Forex? Because as you mentioned, it's not well. There's certain benefits in futures that don't exist in forex. Why has that become the default, and people are going out of their way to trade forex as opposed to futures? I think it's just because forex is what is most known in the industry. I think that's I really so. it. Because and it's also what offers you the most amount of leverage. Because even though the U.S. tries to crack down on it, there's a lot of people still offering unregulated brokers mm. in the U.S. And it's like, oh, you can flip this hundred dollar account into five thousand. It's like you can't really do that but this is where i would also say any any you any, any us mentor a, any us guru like forex guru that says that they don't trade on a broker on a regulated broker because they don't have enough leverage because they want to flip an account it's absolute bullshit because it's 1 to 50 leverage on a regulated broker that is more than enough mm. to flip whatever account you want but they just don't do it because you can't fake a regulated broker, mm. right? They all go for unregulated brokers. Like, and it's so funny because someone was calling prop firms out while promoting an unregulated broker, and they were like, "Oh, I was right about the my forex fund situation," but then shut shut up when the broker that they were promoting went down, mm. right? So, so it's it's a huge. It's a huge conflict of interest and people go into Forex because it's where they can manipulate the most. So that is what you have the most on social media and that is what then gets the most mm. amount of people in. Speaking from my own experience, I know a lot about Forex because well, that's what I was exposed to. So when people ask like, why did you pick Forex over crypto or stocks or whatever? It's just what I was exposed yeah. to. And when you spend five years on something, you don't want to pivot because yeah. it's an unknown, even if they are quite similar. So my depth of experience is in Forex and then in stocks, crypto or futures, I have no experience. Yeah. Um, so for me as an individual, let's say I was in the US, I wouldn't want to switch because I'm like, I have too much knowledge and, and experience and everything here. Even if it's similar, that small difference could be enough to lose an edge, let's say. So for someone who is switching from Forex, yeah, Forex to futures, there's some benefits, as you said, it's centralized, but what should they, they look out for? Because it's, it's by situation that they're forced yeah. to, but they should also be aware of like, okay, switching over is gonna cost you X, Y, Z. They, there's, there's actually not much cost because for Euro dollar, you have futures for Euro, you have futures for dollar, you have futures for pound. And if you look at the futures for Euro, they're very similar to Euro dollar. Mm. So you can literally trade if, you're, if you are in the US and you are trading CFDs, but you, now you don't have access to it and you really want to stick to FX, you can just go for, um, for futures on Euro, for example. As in it's, it's a one-to-one -one price feed. Yes. No, it's not a one to one. Okay. It's not this is this, but if you look if you put both price action Similar side by enough. side, you'll okay. see that it's basically the same. Okay, interesting. So if it's not a one to one, but it's similar, what is causing futures market to move? Is it its own supply and demand and its own liquidity, or is it pegged in a way that at times it will deviate, or, if, or maybe you don't even know. I, I don't know what is the origin. Well, it, that's always what I've asked myself, which is like- certain markets are synthetic. They're just man-made. So yeah. that is kind of useless because yeah. there's nothing behind it. Whereas we know currency has utility and therefore it's not just manipulatable in the same way. Crypto in a sense has utility. The stock market is a valuation of company. What, I don't know, I mean, it's my ignorance, but what yeah. is futures? Yeah, I think <laughs> this is, I think, I don't know if this is true or not, but this comes down to a chicken and the egg type of situation, which is, and I think someone has the answer. I'm just, I'm, I don't know enough to, to, to yeah. say on it. 
Because I don't know if it's the futures pricing that affects CFD pricing, like euro dollar, or if it's euro dollar that affects the future. But I would say I would say highly unlikely the futures affects the the CFD because a lot of the price movement on euro dollar is not from speculators making profit. It's from genuine use of the currency. An oil deal is going on. Somebody needs to buy a lot of dollar, so they they're utilizing the currency. Whereas futures, I know it's just I don't even know. I won't even I won't even comment. <laughs> Interesting though. Um, so if you were you have a lot of US viewers that are now in this predicament whether I either go with futures or I either move to sea trader or another one and buy my time would you rather kind of say cut your losses and move to futures or FX will be around long enough there'll always be a workaround and, and there's so much money to be made that people innovate in finances that's kind of like stay in FX FX will always be around prop firms in the US I don't know right because now, if you always want to stick to with FX, there's brokers that allow you to do that in the US, like regulated brokers where you can trade FX. Then if you want to pivot into futures, then... And, and are they opening prop firms? Because I've seen no. Rwanda was... Yes, the, but... So uh, if you have regulated brokers doing prop firms, then there's no issue. But they won't get into the US though. Uh, uh, Rwanda didn't yeah, open up Rwanda in the US. Rwanda opened okay. in the most random countries I've seen. I've okay. seen not even Portugal is included. I think the UAE oh. is, Portugal is not, I think Germany is not, US is not. It's legal re UK regulatory not. things. Okay, yeah, I okay. think so. Okay, so in that case, it's, it, you think uh, FX is not going anywhere, that's for sure. Yeah. FX for the US with prop firms, potentially. Probably, yeah. Those people that are affected by that, what should they do? I think if this goes down to the basics of being a trader, it's like, do you really just need prop firms to be profitable? I understand that they're a huge stepping stone for people, but I know dozens of people that have made money without prop firms too. So mm -hmm. the reality is, let's say in my first year of trading, I didn't know about prop firms yet. I know I knew I was going to be a profitable trader, that I was going to be a full-time trader because I was thinking, okay, I'll be profitable and then the money will come. Listen, if I, tell to, if I tell anyone that I know that it is high net worth individual, and people now might say, oh, I don't know any high net worth individuals. <clears throat> Think about your father's boss. Like they have good money, probably. Mm -hmm. So there's, you don't need $5 million to be able to trade, right? You can do it with 100K, 200K, whatever. And you can, you can gather that from investors. But first, they want to see proof of work, proof of concept, mm -hmm. right? So be profitable, like focus on FX. If that's really what you want to do, focus on FX and just try to be profitable on your own personal broker. So then mm -hmm. after one year of track record or more, you can go to someone even like Umar Ashraf. He wasn't looking for FX, but he's looking to open a trading floor. But the, what does he ask for? two years track record at mm. least. How many people can provide a two year track record? They can't. Mm. So if you have that, think about how much further ahead you are from 99% of prop firm traders. Mm. It doesn't matter how much money they're making with prop firms because they, yeah. they would never be able to go the professional route. It's interesting as well because when you're working with prop firms, there's that hidden thing of they're against you. They have to catch you somehow for them to exist which for a decently profitable trader, it's an opportunity worth using. For the gambler, it's, it's yep. just a net non-profitable approach. But it's kind of like you're partnering with a company that is not on your side. But then when you partner up with an investor, they're totally on your side. They yep. want you to make money because that's how they make money. Yep. And now that, now that you've reminded me, Burned, a friend of mine who I've yeah, done a pod with, he's working with pro typical prop firms, the mm -hmm. B-Book ones, but he's also working with one A book prop firm, which is Real Capital, which is basically them going out to find investors and they're saying, we have this trader burned and he's found this profitability. Do you want to invest in him and, yep. and, and his track record? And then that's just like what a typical trader is. So yep. uh, as you actually rightly said, even if you're in the US, your asset is your track record. It's not your vehicle because yep. the vehicle will come. Yeah, Beautiful. Um, I think we've spoken at length on, on prop firms and even the industry as a whole. I want to spend the last moments just being a little bit more about yourself uh, because before I invited you onto the pod, you gave a bit of like, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I have enough to talk about. I said, no worries, bro. People will learn from you. Um, but one thing is you are young and you have a whole career ahead of you, but you've achieved a lot already. Maybe not in your head enough for you to be on a podcast, but regardless, you have achieved a lot. Um, and I want to talk about that because you, you're young, you've just moved to Dubai, you've left your friends and your family and, and what is home to you in pursuit of your journey. And that's what a lot of people aspire to do. Maybe you're not at the, the end goal you want to be, but you're certain steps ahead of others. 
and that is relatable. So your journey from, you know, you're you're a kid in England at university to now just moving to Dubai and and having a decent net worth already for your age. What does that journey look like, and what is twenty twenty four and moving to Dubai and that journey of leaving home? What what has that been for, been like for you? Yeah, so it's funny because I've only understood how detrimental to my life moving was. So when I w- when I went into the UK, I thought, yeah, my life is going to change, and it did change for the positive. So I got a hold of myself when I moved into the UK. But when I went back to Portugal, I noticed I have no friends, right? Like. I didn't know anyone because I missed the opportunity of going to university and mm-hmm. making friends. But I've always understood ever since I was 16 that you have to sacrifice certain things in order to get where you want to be. And I've always had that mentality for myself when it comes into business. I, 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 I knew that, and it's so funny because this is so cliche, oh, I don't want to work a nine to five. Well, oh, guess what? No one wants to work a nine to five or very few people want to mm-hmm. work a nine to five. But I always was able to sacrifice what I wanted in the moment for the future. And I always mm-hmm. focused on the process too. And that is that has been one of the biggest mistakes that I've done in this past one year where I started focusing way more on the outcomes. So I was looking back through my YouTube videos and I'm so grateful for YouTube because not only has it helped me a lot in my journey, but also because it forced me to document my life. Mm. So, because I started YouTube just to document my trading journey. And it ended up me documenting my life journey, me documenting moving moving to put back to Portugal, then moving to a new house, then moving now to Dubai, everything is documented and I can pinpoint exactly what was going on. And when I moved to Portugal, I was looking at my subscriber count and I had like 700 subscribers when I moved to Portugal. Okay. So I knew I was just a delusional kid that wasn't making any money, had a couple of, uh, had a little bit of money saved up and believed in one dream. But I never thought about FTMO. I never thought about having 70,000 subscribers. I never thought about like the quality of the things that I was putting out. I was just constantly doing it. So ever since I started YouTube, I've posted one video every single week for like four years. I, I think I missed like three months because I wanted to stop and and then I came back and I was like, hey, like consistency, that is that is the way to go. You know that with the podcast too. Mm-hmm. Like c- first couple of podcasts, you don't get any views, but then mm-hmm. things start to pick up. Like we know, Riz, same thing. Like a l- beginning of last year, he had 5,000 subscribers. It's crazy. I was looking Riz's, at the pod yeah. and I was like, hey, this is a really nice pod. I think mm-hmm. it's going to blow up and then ends up at 150K or 100K. Yeah. It's Legend. wild. And yeah. that is, again, it's so cliche. It's representative of life though. But it's the power of consistency. Yeah. And even today, I was looking back through my life and, and and one friend of mine, he was like, hey, I don't know how you do it, but everything you say you're going to do, it happens. Mm. And, and that happened because when I was making, let's say, X amount of money every single month, I was out loud saying, hey, next year I'm going to be making 10 times as much. And then... I don't even know how I was making that type of money because I never focused on the money. And that, I think that's one of the reasons why people like the the YouTube channel too. It's because mm. I'm not forcing anything onto anyone. I, I, I interviewed this CEO of my Forex funds and I was telling him how trash his firm was. Like the slippage was bad. The customer support was was bad. And people were expecting me to be like, oh, I said, I'm so happy to meet you. And I was like, hey, you know, th- <laughs> these things are bad, right? Yeah. Because I never sold my soul as some other people are doing. And I don't, mm-hmm. again, I don't blame them for them. Hey, I don't pay those people's bills. So they have to pay the bills somehow. But like, I think the fo- the fact that I've always focused on the process was the reason I've gotten this far. And again, it sounds cliche, but what I tell people is that if you do that in three years time, you will look back and you will feel exactly the same. Mm. And for this, for 2024, it's kind of the same. Like I have an idea of how much I'm, or how much money I want to make. I have an idea on where I want to be by the end of the year, how much funding I want to have, how many payouts I want to have, how much net worth I want to have. But then it goes down to the goal setting. Okay. What are you doing tomorrow? Yep. What are you doing tomorrow to get you to that place? Mm. And I've always understood the more you chase it, the less you are going to get it. So let's say that I, I would come to you and I would be like, hey, there's 
this this company that wants to work with you and and my only sole goal was be was would be for you to open up the partnership so I would make money. You would notice it from the get go, and you would be like, uh, "There's something that I don't like going on mm-hmm. here. That has happened to me." Or someone was like, "Hey, like I really think you should you should do this and this, and I'm going to make money." Th- that person would go was going to make money, and I was like, mm, "Not really what I want." Mm. But my perspective was always give. And eventually will you will receive. And that is how, I don't know how, I've always achieved the goals. Mm. It's like I've, I was always willing to give. So to the process, to the market, to the prop firm, mm. to the YouTube, to the to the audience, to you, to anyone that I meet. Like I'm not, I don't ask for anything mm. because I know that eventually the the universe will, will go back to you and reward you. If, if I'm to comment on what you've just said, it's, it's kind of like, let's say, a law of attraction, but it's very notable. It's, you're not just doing, I have a goal, I want to, and, and you're doing affirmations and everything. Yeah. It's you have a goal, you have a desire, you have your own self-worth, and then you put in steps. Right? Yeah. And you actually reverse engineer and you put your daily goals in, in line with that goal, which is why you've achieved them, I think. Yeah. Um, the other thing is... Um, the friendship side because you kind of and I had something similar when I moved to Spain for university when I went back to the UK for it was three months I just felt an alien because I was no longer neither politically aligned my people around me I lost my friends I lose touch after six years in Madrid going back to your old high school friends either I haven't spoke to them in six yeah. years or they're doing the same things I was doing six years ago. And I'm like, well, there's been no growth. So then that home environment didn't feel like home. And then that by a process of elimination of where I want to live, I ended up in Dubai. My blessing was that I had a, a core group around me that were aligned with me, same goals and, and same mission and everything. So where we went as a team, it didn't matter. And we had our vision. But in your perspective, because you are a, almost like a solo trader, solo entrepreneur and everything, when you've moved to the UK and you're feeling a little bit alone, then you move back home and you're a little bit alone and you've just moved to Dubai. And I think a lot of people are like that. They, yeah. They're just like, they're on their mission and they don't have people around them that are necessarily aligned, relate or just inspiring them. How has that affected you? It, it's funny because while I was, I was saying that and thinking it through, I was going to basically bring it back to people, which is, Everyone maybe or some people that are watching this right now feel lost. The reality is like all of us feel lost and and all of us sometimes feel alone. All of us sometimes feel like, am I really doing the right thing? And if you just give it time, because I think myself, I I, I suffer from this a lot. I I don't think 10 years ahead. It Mm. was funny because when we were when we were at the at the dinner at the dinner place, and Alex told me, hey, why don't you just start small? And it, it was such a simple tip. But I was like, a, a light head, uh, a light, light bulb, bulb yeah. popped off. And I was like, why am I not starting small? Right? Because what Alex said was like, hey, just start here and then just gradually build upon it. And I was like, oh, okay, that's really what, it, what I have to do. And a lot of people right now, they feel alone. Some people feel alien to where they're at. Some mm. people can't can't really can't really connect themselves with their friends. And what I it's it's, it's a weird tip, but it's like just let time pass. Like focus mm. on your thing because eventually it will come back to you. Because right now everyone that ignored me before is like, hey bro, like what are you going to do this this yeah. this Saturday, right? And I'm like, well, I'm going to do the same thing as always. I'm going to work. Right, because you have to focus on you have, you have to sacrifice short-term pleasure for long-term results, and that is sometimes about not being with your friends every single day. And mm. I think it also it's important for people to understand that I'm not saying don't have any friends, because we know that this red pill community right now is like, oh, if they don't align with your values, don't be with them. You're the average of the five people you surround yourself with the most. Well, yes, but for example, this last year, I was when I was in Lisbon, when I was living with a couple of friends, when I was leaving, I was we were reflecting on what we enjoyed the most. And it wasn't work. It was like the times we enjoyed like mm. going on for a bike ride, right? So there are small things that count, but mm. if you're feeling alone right now, 
Just have faith that eventually it will come back to you. Don't force it. Don't chase the cat. Mm. Like lure the cat in. Like I'm, I'm constantly, um, there, there's a story about the spider web and I think it's from Luke Belmar. I saw this, I saw this clip. It's not that I really vouch for him, but I, I it's, uh, it, there, it's, yeah. it's the message that was great, which is he was going through the forest. There was a big spider web and that spider web is the ecosystem that you build when no one is watching. Mm. And then you just let your the food go into the spider web and that's where you where, that's where you feast. And that's mm. exactly what I felt looking back. And I didn't know I was doing these things. And that is the thing. Everyone is lost. Like I don't know what the hell I'm doing in Dubai right now. <laughs> but I know that in one year's one year's time I'm going to I'm going to be like, oh, this is a huge shift in my life. For sure. So sure. it's that's what people have to put into into perspective, which is right now I don't see where this is leading me to. You need to have an idea of where you want to go, obviously, because if your goal is to become a funded trader, but for ten hours a day you're playing video games, then that doesn't make any sense. Mm. But you need you need to balance short term with long term. You need to understand that eventually things will play out. And uh, I've heard this from Reality Transurfing and 78 Days to Transurfing, a book that Umar Ashraf recommended. It's like, hey, listen, like the world outside is a reflection of your, wor of your world inside. If I'm just looking for money, you are going to notice that I'm just looking for money. And so we are not going to have any type of connection because you're mm. like, uh, there's something off here. So... It's, it's the small actions or small thoughts that you have on a mm -hmm. daily basis that get you, it's a compound effect on the smallest things. So if you get your mind right and you, for example, 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson, hugely important book for my life. And if you do small things every single day that gets you closer to God, which means in line with proper values, you will get there. Mm -hmm. Beautiful messages in there. Uh, one thing that I came to mind as you were speaking was um, people understanding the goal that they have, how to achieve it. If it's to be put in a formula, how I, I don't know, I don't even think I got it from anywhere. I think I just thought of it was uh, it's hard work. That's a that's a necess necessity. Having a good mentor, it's basically a necessity. Having a, a good education, it's a necessity. And then time and leverage. Yeah. These five things together, if you if you engineer all of them. You will have a desirable outcome. Yeah, and I would sprinkle a little bit of luck in there too. Oh yeah, true, true, bro. Yeah, it's, it's God's will or luck or whatever you want to call it, but there's always external factors where things just align. But your own preparation allowed you to take heed of that yeah. opportunity or luck or whatever. True. Um, that was one thing. Another thing was the, the idea of friendship. It seems like you were almost allowing yourself to be detached. Whereas when I was younger, my friends, I'm, I'm talking in high school, I mean, my friend's opinion meant the world to me. Like if they thought I had a bad haircut, I had a bad haircut. If they if they thought I was an idiot, I was an idiot. Like it was what they said and I didn't have a self-identity. And maybe even a little bit beyond that is when you get your own self-identity and you have your own independence, you still want to be accepted by your tribe, by your friends. And therefore friendship can be like the biggest anchor in life where people will not pursue a goal simply for the opinion of their friends that's an anchor. And and you have to realize what is a friendship? Well, a friendship for me was in the beginning, people to hang out with, people to pass time with. And I think that's the definition of a lot of people's friendships. It's just people to have fun with, people to chill with. When I shifted my approach to, I'm gonna grow. And if my friends don't grow with me, it's not my responsibility what they do. So if I buy time, I'll grow my friendships and we don't align and they think it's weird that I wanna do whatever I'm doing. I outgrew them and they didn't follow. So I have to let them go. And it's not yeah. like a forceful thing of you're not my friend. It's just you You just distance. And if they now value as a friend and they level up alongside you, that's a true friend. And, and that's some of the friends I have. Then I also have friends of this. They're just my hangout friends. Yeah. I'll pass time on a Tuesday with them. But I don't see them as like my friends. I see yeah. them as like more acquaintances or hangout people. And then there's like the brotherhood. The, these are your people that you go to for, for business advice, for life advice, for your feeling down, for accountability. That's your real tribe. And if, when I was in that stage, and a lot of people are, if you're just with friends that you hang out with and they're your anchors, you have to outgrow them and you will, you will face a lonely, uncomfortable window where it's just like you've arrived in a new city now, you don't have a tribe yet. 
but you'll get there because yeah. you'll, you'll find your like-minded people and, and like myself yeah. we, we've developed a friendship not because of our hobbies not because of your political views we've aligned and become friends because of a common mission that's yeah. what a friendship should be and I think when you transcend from friendship to hang out with which is an anchor to friendships of common goals which will you know compound your growth and, and excel each other that's a real friendship and I think just knowing what a friendship is and changing your definition makes it easy to accept those lonely periods whether you're moving country or you're just outgrowing people the last thing i wanted to say upon what you had said was there was this joe rogan clip i saw which was like what would you do and how would you live if you had a film crew filming you 24 7 then you probably wouldn't need that cookie or you'd probably do that workout because you know it's going to be documented and people are going to watch and when he said that it was such a thing in my head of like it's a way to be self-accountable or just have this mental exercise of even if no one's watching, you know, self-motivation is one of the most important things for an entrepreneur or a trader. Like, there's no boss telling you what to do. You got to do it. Yeah. And if you're not intrinsically <clears throat> motivated, you got to have cues. And I think that one for me was huge of like, if there's a people watching, what would I do? Okay, then do that. Um, and then that ref the, the mirror of that for you is your YouTube channel. You've documented your whole life. And I'm sure in that process, you started to do things that you could make content about and speak about. So therefore you were doing the things you were supposed to do that you knew you had to do, but if you didn't have a YouTube channel, maybe you wouldn't have. You would yeah. have got lazy with it or whatever. And I think that's the beauty of what we do is putting our stuff out there. And for me now, just posting my trades that I have been for a while, it's now another form of accountability because I might take a crappy trade and no one's going to know about it and yeah. whatever. And I took a loss. But now if I'm putting it online, well, then i got to make sure it's a good trade. Otherwise, I'm going to have a backlash and I'm going to, why did I even post that trade? So it's kind of like hacking your environment with, with friendships, accountability and all these things. And, and I think you're knowing what's with the tide and i think your moves in life and, and relocating to dubai is going with the tide and you have your goals you have you know you where you want to be and it looks like you pick situations and opportunities that allow you to go with that tide and then you make those outlandish comments i'll, I'll be making 10x what i am next year and it seems to play yeah. out for you and i think it's these minutiae these little details that you do in your mindset that maybe you didn't even think about but as a friend observing, I think it's these little things that you do, where for you it's just, I do what I do, but looking outside in, it's you do these things that, which is why you are in the position you are now, a normal guy from Portugal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Kimbo, thank you very much for joining. I, th uh, I think the reservations you had of what are we going to talk about, we had a brilliant conversation and probably even we could have a part two, but thank you very much for joining. And I, I know we're going to be in the same city now and, and we have the same goals and everything. So I'm going to do my level best to be accountable <laughs> to you and, and I'm sure you will vice versa. And that's what a friendship is. Uh, and as well, thank you for coming on as a friend. Thank you for inviting me. Boom.